Well, hey, this morning uh, we are in part three of a new series uh, that we've uh, been in First Peter. And uh, so if you haven't been here the last couple weeks, uh, I just want to give you a quick recap of what's been going on. First, first of all, uh, this, this book in the New Testament, this was written to uh, believers across the Roman Empire. They had been completely scattered. Uh, they were undergoing some, some pretty intense persecution. And uh, Peter writes this letter to them. Now, this is towards the end of Peter's life. Uh, Peter has seen some intense persecution happen uh, throughout the time, but it's, but it's growing. And, and he's realizing that these believers that are spread throughout the Roman Empire, they need encouragement. And, and they need uh, to have the right focus. And, and so in his letter, we, we kind of get this tone that we're all going to go through opposition in life. But when that opposition comes, it's an opportunity for us to live out our faith and to show the world what a difference it makes to have Jesus Christ in our hearts and our lives. And, and Peter is telling them that they constantly need to be reminded of who they are. Because when we understand who we are in Christ, it'll give us this blueprint of how we are to live. And, and so one of the keys that we hit on these last couple of weeks is simply this, living a holy life, it's not just what you get rid of out of your life. We all understand that pursuing holiness means getting rid of sin. And we talked about that last week, repenting from sin, going the other direction, getting rid of all these different things. You remember the, uh, the idea of the junk drawer, all those sins, right, uh, that we have in there. Those, all those things need to be cleaned out. But understand this, living a holy life, it's not just what you get rid of in your life, but it's also what you chase after. And so in the letter, we were challenged last week. He's saying, get rid of these things that are in your life, but also chase after and, and crave after the, the things of God. So we understood last week, uh, our point was that being leads to doing, right? We can do good deeds but when Christ is inside your heart, when he has changed your life, when he's transforming your heart, that's going to lead to action. It has to. That's what the first and the second greatest commandment is, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And what's the second commandment is to love others. And so we have to really look inside and say, God, do I truly, truly love you if I'm not willing to go out and love the world the way that you wanted me to and show them the difference? It's very challenging. So as we get into this uh, third part, and then after this, uh, Pastor Doug starting a series, we're going to probably revisit this later in the fall to finish First Peter. But um, as we end today, it's, it's kind of interesting because uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about some difficult things. And, and, and so I, I just want to start. I want you to imagine right now in your mind, because this probably shouldn't be too hard. Have you, ever, have you ever been asked to do something that you didn't want to do? Have you ever been asked to do something that you didn't want to do? Now, what's even funnier is if you can think of the reaction that you might have had, right? What are some of those common reactions? Somebody asks you to do something you really don't want to do, and you might just kind of like do this eye roll like, ugh, you know? Or you might just like kind of physically be like, ugh, you know? All these, I'm, I'm kind of thinking too of like when I tell my kids like, hey, you need to go clean your room. They're like, ugh, you know? Because we don't always want to, do something that's asked of us. Well, there's this funny story. I, I think this is something that some of you may have heard before. But this is a story about four people, right? Named everybody, somebody, anybody, and nobody. Here's the story. There was an important job to be done, and everybody was sure that somebody would do it. Anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized that everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have. <laughs> Isn't it true, though, that uh, oftentimes, uh, you know, we're put in the midst of a situation and uh, we're like, well, you know, God, I know you might be calling me to do something like this, but I, I think, you know, my brother in Christ over here could probably do this. Or, or uh, you're, you're asked to do something and you think like, hey, my siblings could help out with this. And, and so sometimes we have to really stop and think about what's going on inside of our lives. Why is it that we're not wanting to accomplish 
uh, what, what God's calling us to do. And, and this could be something even from your workplace, you know? Uh, maybe you've worked for uh, a boss that has asked you to do things that you, you don't like doing and, and you struggle with how you're going to respond to those things. Or, or maybe at home, you know, as we've already talked about, your father and mother kind of say, hey, we, we need you to do this or we need you to do that. And it's not always what you want to be doing. And, and we've all had a, a, a time where, where we've had this happen in our lives. But even more so this morning, what I want to get into is, is our spiritual lives because they're no exception. You know, the Christian life does not come naturally to us because the Christian life, what God calls us to each and every day is to die to self, and that does not come naturally. So as we study Scripture, we're going to find that certain portions of Scripture are going to be more difficult to grasp than others. But it's important that we continue to embrace all of God's truth, and and we trust that he's given it to us for our good and for his glory. And so as we get into uh, 1 Peter uh, 2, we're going to be starting in in verse 13 today. And and what Peter is now getting at, again, remember that these Christians, these believers, they were living under a very oppressive government. They were living under intense persecution. Last week, we were even talking about uh, the Roman emperor Nero and the terrible things he would do to Christians, throwing them in gladiator rings so that they would be brutally uh, defeated. Uh, even going to the extreme of dipping them in wax and and using them as lanterns in his own yard. Crazy, crazy things. So we see that as we get into 1 Peter chapter 2, I have no idea, Pastor Adam. (laughs) I wasn't ready for the mood music yet. But as we get into 1 Peter 2, we're going to jump into verse 13, and here's what Peter's talking about. He's going to tell him how to live a godly life, a holy life, under an oppressive government. Read with me in verse 13. You, you probably have this on your handout as well. It says, submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong, and to commend to those who do right. And so we have this command from Peter to submit ourselves to the human authority. And and I think in a lot of us, uh, these questions start to well up inside immediately. I think, well, what if the government does something like this over here? Or how far is too far? If they start doing something like this, am I still supposed to follow this human authority? And and are you sure, God, that this is really what I'm supposed to be doing in my life? But what we're going to see is that choosing to be set apart, Peter is going to tell his audience, choosing to be set apart and to be holy includes submission to civil authorities. And it's not because of their inherent goodness, right? We can all say amen to that. No man is perfect. There's no inference in Scripture that says that our civil authorities deserve submission, right? But instead, Peter just calls them to submit. And in verse 13, you know, Peter uses this word in Greek, it's it's hupotasso. And and that is a word that's regularly regularly translated as submit. Uh, And and for some time, I, I think this idea of submission... In general, it's, it's kind of had a negative connotation, right? People usually have a negative reaction when we hear the word submit, and, and for a good reason. Uh, throughout history, under the, the guise of, of uh, all types of biblical use, people have called for submission, and, and really it was to do terrible things. Uh, you know, abusing people, uh, having slaves, um, it, all these impoverished ways that clearly contradict Scripture. But that's not at all what Peter is talking about here. When, when he uses this term, hupotasso, it's, it's not a synonym for the word obey. Rather, what he's getting at is, is that this idea of submission, it's a voluntary decision to honor another person in a very particular way. So in no way does sub, submission suggest inferiority of any kind. When we're called to submit to the civil authorities, that doesn't mean the person who is submitting is is inferior 
But what we have to note is as we go through this, Peter is not focusing, he's not concerned with transforming how society worked. What Peter was instead focused on was transforming individuals so that as Christ got more and more into their life and transformed it, that they would shine that outward and see society changed around them. That God would work in their heart and then he would use it for his good to impact society in a positive way. And what you have to understand, too, is, is the Christians back in this time, in the Holy Roman Empire, they would have not had the same freedoms that we have today. You know, today we have a government that's what? Of the people, by the people, and for the people. And as small as it may be, we have a voice. We have a voice. That was not the case for the Christians uh, that Peter is writing to, to his audience, they don't have those same freedoms. They were in a worse situation than you and I today, and yet Peter was still calling them to submit. And so we have to ask the question this morning, why? Why would he tell them to submit to those civil authorities? You know, again, these Christians, they're being mistreated. They're being persecuted. And, and I would tell you this morning, if anyone had the opportunity to make a compelling argument that they should rebel or that they could rebel, it would have definitely been Peter's audience. With everything happening to them, they would have had the best argument as to why they should rebel against the government. But let's see what, what Peter says as we continue on in verse 15. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. So as these people were being falsely accused, you know, um, Rome, they were, they were being accused of insurrection, you know, because they weren't following the practices of the country. They were being accused of insurrection and rebellion against Rome. They were being accused of atheism because they would not worship Caesar. They would not worship these other Roman gods. They were being accused of incest because Christians of that day, just like we hear today, they would call each other brother and sister. So there is a lot of hostility. And, and when that kind of hostility comes, I think there's a very natural reaction that wells up inside of us to get defensive immediately. We want to get defensive. You know, you're going you're gonna to say something about me, I'm going to take you to court. And, and uh, we'll, we'll have a lawsuit. Those are the natural reactions that we see today. And the only way that we can have an answer to these reactions and to these accusations has to come from our lives, from how we live. We have to do such good deeds to show kindness, to give generously, that you can silence the ignorant talk. That's what Peter's telling his audience. Do such good deeds that how you live and what you do silences the ignorant talk. And it would be easy to think about wanting to make your voice heard. If you were in a situation where you were coming under great persecution and accusation, you'd probably want to be loud, make signs, walk through the streets talking about how unjust everything is, right? But I think Peter's telling his audience, but what if, what if we tried something different? Instead of reacting wrongly, what if we did what God's calling us to do? To do these radical acts of kindness, radical acts of generosity. And, and this really is the most effective way to live. We're, we're encouraged here to live in such a way that as you engage the culture, the prejudices of people won't hold up against you. And not only that, but Peter is saying not only will the prejudices not hold up, but that they'll be won over by your actions. Imagine showing such kindness and such love and generosity to somebody that they go, you know what, I have no idea what's going on with you, but that's what I want in my life. I just, I actually heard a story uh, from another pastor this week. We were having coffee on Thursday, and, and he was talking about the idea of loving your enemies. And he said, okay, God, if I'm supposed to love my enemy, who's my enemy? And he thought of the one person in high school that there were truly arch enemies, just going after each other all the time. This guy didn't care for him one bit. And uh, he started just calling him up, inviting him to hang out, go get a coffee, do all these things. And this guy ended up getting, accepting Christ in his heart, and, and they, they're now inseparable. They're best friends. 
Imagine living in such a way that not only will people feel Christ's love, but they're going to want it too in their hearts. Here's what I know. As the world becomes more hostile, the church must become increasingly holy. And part of holiness, according to this passage, is submitting to the governmental authorities. Now, I just want to pause here and say, this doesn't mean that we follow authority when it goes against God's word. We see this in, in the book of Acts. We, we should never follow earthly powers that go directly against God's word. We have to prioritize our obedience to God over our obedience to our country. God's word is our first allegiance. And we're going to see how this played out in Peter's life. Uh, Acts chapter 5, there's this whole section that goes from verse 17 to 42, and we're going to look at a portion of this section to see what was going on in Peter's life. So Acts chapter 5 in verse 17, it starts off this way. Then the high priest and all his associates were members of the party of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles, and they put him in the public jail. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and, and tell the people all about this new life. Now, I want to pause here for a second. Think about, I, I, I've mentioned this before, it's so easy for us as we go through Scripture to kind of glaze over these passages, right? Right? But it, it tells us that the uh, apostles were put in public jail. And that, that night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors and brought them out and gave them a very specific instruction to stand in the temple courts and tell the people about this new life. If that happened to you tonight, if you were put in public jail and then God sent an angel and opened the doors and said, I want you to go right downtown in the middle of the square and, and, and share with people about this new life that you have, would you do it? Boy, you talk about a direct command. So let's see what, how it uh, continues in verse 21. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts, and as they had been told, they began to teach the people. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin, the full assembly of the elders of Israel, and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving to the jail, the officers did not find them there. So when they went back and, and they reported, they said, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now let me pause here for, for, another, for just a second. I kind of feel bad a little bit for these poor guards, right, that are standing in front of a locked jail cell, for, you know, probably have their spears and, and looking all, you know, the boss is coming. Everybody looked really good and, and shiny and, you know, everything, sharp point on my spear and they come in and they find that they're gone how would you <laughs> how would you react if you were that guard you'd be like what you know I think I just lost my job so they opened it they found no one inside on hearing this report the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss wondering what this might lead to and so they someone came and said look the men that you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people at that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared that the people would stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. They said this, we gave you strict orders not to teach in his name, meaning the name of Jesus. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And listen to this. In verse 29, Peter and the other apostles replied, what? We must obey God rather than human beings. Now, scholars believe that this would have taken a place uh, shortly after Jesus' death, maybe around 30 AD. Uh, the letter was that we have uh, been going through in 1 Peter, that was written about 30 years later, okay? So, the question is, Peter did this, right? They said, hey, quit teaching about Jesus. And they're like, hey, uh, we're, we're not going to obey uh, man when it's going against what God's telling us to do. So 30 years later, the question is, has Peter changed his tune? Is, is this now a, a contradiction in Scripture? 
And, and the, the answer is no. Peter is using his wisdom to determine how to act. He's using his wisdom. He's telling his audience to follow the ruling authorities in life unless they go directly against God's word. So what's the real issue here? What, what about this idea of following civil authorities? You know, the real issue is that most of us, most of the time, we want to follow our own will. We want to do what feels right to us. You know, I, I, I mean, we probably, uh, there's a number of people that probably joke about this, right? Hey, what's the speed limit? Oh, you know, it's like 70-ish, you know? If I, uh, my wife, uh, who's from northern Indiana, they had a saying, I guess, about Michigan drivers, nine over, you're fine, 10 over, you're mine. Maybe you've heard that before. We, I guess we feel that we can drive nine miles per hour over the speed limit. Right, we, we, we do these things that we feel like, well, this probably should be the speed limit. I'm okay to do this. Or, hey, I'm not really supposed to park in this spot over here, but it's closer to the door. No one will mind. Uh, you know, they shouldn't have marked it for, you know, so and so. And, and so all these different things. You know, a lot of times we want to follow our own will and do what feels right to us. That's what comes natural to the flesh, isn't it? And so I think this is why Peter is, is having to challenge his audience, these Christians, to submit to authority. But here's how it continues uh, in 1 Peter 2.16. He says to live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. And then in verse 17, it continues, show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. And so here's what we see. He says to live as free people, right? We love freedom, don't we? We love freedom. But why do we want it? Why do we want freedom? What do we want to do with that freedom? Do we want freedom so that we can use it as a cover-up for evil? That's what Peter's telling his audience not to do. Don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Do we want freedom so that we can live according to God's will and God's way? We saw that as... Uh, one of the large parts of the, even the founding of this nation. They didn't want to be under another nation that was telling them exactly what, how they had to believe or what they had to do. So Peter is telling them, you, you've got to submit to God by also submitting to others. And now, in verse 18, he takes it a whole other step. He says, slaves, in reverent fear of God, submit yourselves to your masters. Not only to those who are good and considerate, but also to those who are harsh. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. Now, slavery at this time, in, uh, in, in the early uh, New Testament era, it was not based on, on race or color, much of what we hear about today. But slavery was still inhumane. And, and so as Peter is writing to this, uh, this letter, he's writing this again to the believers in the Roman Empire. He's writing this to transformed individuals that want to make a positive impact on society, even when they don't have that position or the influence. So when you think about this word submit, this is placing yourself under somebody else, but it's by choice. And not only is it by choice, but it's also with a happy spirit. You and I, what Peter is telling his audience back then, he's saying you have to make the decision to submit. And that's a decision that has to come from your heart. Because if you submit to someone when you have no choice, right? If, if you don't have any choice at all, what credit is that to you? If you submit to somebody because they're really nice, because they're really fair and, and they, they do all these nice things for you, what credit is that to you? But if you submit uh, to ruling authority that is unjust, you make that decision, I'm going to submit, even though they're not just, that's a whole different story. And that's what Peter's getting at. He's saying even when they're harsh, even to these authorities that are not good, they're not considerate. So he's telling this people, make the decision to submit. And Peter, 
when he was talking to these that were slaves in this time, he was literally making decision makers out of people who would not normally be able to make any type of decision. You know, it wasn't their intent uh, to be in slavery. And they wouldn't be able to make these decisions. But he's saying, you can make one to submit yourself, to place yourself under their authority with a happy spirit. And to do it so that they'll see a difference in your life. So how is this work for us today? How is this the same for, for you and I? You know, think about your workplace, where you're at. Can, are you living your life in such a way that right now that your coworkers are seeing a radical difference in your life? Or maybe in your neighborhood where you live? Or in the circles where your kids go to school and, and the relational areas that God has placed you in? How about if you have a tough boss? One that doesn't always treat you fairly or justly. What do you do in that situation? I think Peter's challenging all of us in, in this way as we submit and as we live in a way that is pleasing to him, we're going to be reflecting God's image. And that's what, that's what transformation in our hearts really brings about. It allows us to reflect God's love and God's light and God's truth out clearer and brighter to the world around us. So I think he's really calling his audience, which includes us today, to three main things. To live holy, to love others, and then to learn to submit. Starting back up in verse 21. I don't think I have this one on screen for you. It says, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you. And then let's bring up verse 22. It says, he committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. Speaking of Jesus, right? When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin uh, to sins and live for righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. So because of what Christ has done, because he suffered for you and for me, bearing our sin, our shame, going to the cross in our place, having these insults hurled at him, having people mock him and everything else that happened at that time, because all that happened, because of Christ's love for us, he says, I am now calling you to this, to live holy and to love others, even when they wrong you, to love others, right? We've, we, we can think of other places in the New Testament when God says, hey, if somebody does something wrong to you, show love and kindness back to them. If they demand of you to walk with them a mile, go two miles with them. If they ask for something from you, give it to them and, and even more. He says to what? Love our enemies. It's not easy, but yet it's so simple. We're called to obey and to submit to authority even when it doesn't seem fair. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you. And again, the idea from our first week in this world, we will face opposition. And depending on where you live in the world right now, that looks radically different. Be, pr be in prayer for the Christians, the Christ followers right now in Afghanistan. They're going to be facing opposition that you and I could never even imagine. Here's what we see is that Jesus didn't retaliate. Jesus was insulted, but he didn't try to even the score. Jesus didn't threat revenge. How many opportunities will you and I have today to not retaliate, to not get even? You know, Jesus didn't try to get even, but instead, what did he do? He prayed for his enemies. What did he say on the cross? Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. We have to be content to let God settle the score. He is the one that is just. 
He is the one that is good. So that brings me to our point today, which is more than that. I don't know what happened to that slide. Here's what it's supposed to say. Every day, and you can maybe write what's on your sheet. Every day, I must choose to live holy, to love others, and to learn to submit. To live holy, to love others, and to learn to submit. See, Peter's teaching on submission in all these verses is simple. But nothing about it is easy. Oftentimes it means choosing to follow leaders who abuse their power and and who create environments of hostility and insecurity. And everything inside of us, right, wants to cry out for change and for justice. And and while there's nothing wrong with that, uh, that urge that might well up inside of you, the Bible calls us to give a very careful consideration always to our response. Does it demonstrate the faithfulness of Christ? Or is it just demonstrating merely what our human desires are? Does our response demonstrate the faithfulness of Christ? You know, throughout history, the church has flourished not not primarily based on on persuasive arguments. I, I personally have never argued somebody into the kingdom of heaven by proving them wrong and showing how many points I can hit their counterpoints with. It's not persuasive arguments, but it's demonstrating the love of Christ towards its enemies. As Jesus hung on the cross, right, he cried out to his father uh, to forgive them, the ones who were murdering him. And Peter tells us that Christ's example is one that we, you and I, are called to follow. So as we go about our week, let this call resonate in your heart. Ask the Lord to help you see opportunities to to practice this kind of obedience, to follow him courageously, because when that happens, he grants us these opportunities, and then we see him work. Our life, it's, it's not about us, right? It has to be about making much of the name of Jesus Christ so that others will see and that they'll come to know his love and his forgiveness through Christ Jesus and what he did on the cross. Let's pray. Our precious Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so grateful today, Lord, for your word. Lord, that we can glean all that you have in this passage for us. Lord, as as Peter wrote to his audience and and people that were just going through extreme oppression, uh, Father, maybe our lives and and what we go through today, opposition looks different, but Father, we still have the same opportunities, Lord, to show how we're going to respond, to show how we're going to react, Lord, to, to submit in love, even when it doesn't seem fair or just, that people can see a difference in us, Father, that their eyes, their hearts, Lord, would be turn towards you and, and, and they would ask the question, why? What has made the difference of your life? And we can say it's, it's Jesus, 100%. Lord, I pray for opportunities throughout this week, Lord, that we could respond in love, that we could uh, seek, Lord, opportunities and, and divine appointments, Lord, that, that you would use us in whatever way, Lord, that you want to use us to reach more people in the, for the kingdom of Christ. Lord, help us to each and every day, Lord, die to self because that's what you've called us to. And we need to be less of us, Lord, so that your your love and, and Lord, the way that you want us to respond, Lord, that is reflected out more from our lives, Lord, that we would be more of a salt and more, more of a light. So, Lord, today, use us and may our lives bring you glory. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.